Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, good to see you here. So uh, Dr. Spitter is usually going to be giving the update on COVID-19, but I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the amazing work that uh, many Snohomish County and Health District employees have been doing really day in and day out to respond uh, to COVID and uh, start to think about recovery. But uh, one example, uh, as of yesterday, uh, Snohomish County's Department of Emergency Management, or DEM, has distributed approximately 5.8 million pieces of PPE, 5.8 million pieces of PPE uh, to 567 different entities. Um, but DEM really couldn't, didn't do this work alone. It took staff from our finance department to purchase the PPE. It took our Department of Information Technology to ensure everybody had the tools they needed to purchase, receive, and distribute this material. Uh, it took staff from our Department of Facilities and Fleet to maintain the buildings for storing the materials. So it's really a, a group effort with many involved. So when you are at a healthcare provider in Snohomish County and you see your medical professionals in gloves and masks to keep you safe, there was an entire Snohomish County team behind that to make it happen. Another example, our Nourishing Neighborhoods program has served 10,000 families in 18 separate locations around the county. This has really ensured many families across the county would not go hungry. Uh, we chose those 18 locations uh, because of the uh, need for food in those areas and, and the shortage of availability. So they were strategically placed. So in order to make that ha all happen, we needed our agriculture office to coordinate with farmers. Our human resources department uh, had to hire people and ensure they had their benefits. Um, our human services department uh, had to help us find those families who were the most in need. And our finance department had to make sure people are paid. And beyond that, again, our Department of Facilities and Fleet had to maintain and provide vehicles for transportation. So again, team effort. And then there are those even one step more removed. Um, our assessor's office has to determine taxes. Our treasurer's office had to collect those taxes. Our law and justice system, including the sheriff's office, prosecuting attorney's office, the clerks, the courts, they all work to keep us safe, really. We've had people from across county government working all the time or periodically DEM to help out. Our Department of Emergency Management's been activated since February and uh, has been going nonstop since then. Of course, the county council and my office have been working from the beginning to help make all this happen also. Uh, our partners at Snohomish Health District have been busy running contact tracing, testing, and doing the essential communications work to keep our community as safe as possible. Uh, this has all been really vital to our response. To date, we've had 150 staff from 15 different agencies who have worked over 36,000 hours directly in DEM for our response, 36,000 hours this year since February. Uh, there are also a few thousand people who all work for the county or the health district in various roles to ensure the very complicated response operation can happen successfully. So all these people have been working without much of a break since January, and they've done really an extraordinary job, and uh, I am grateful, and we all should be, for, for their work. We do know there's still quite a way to go in the pandemic response and recovery, I just want to assure the public that they have a really extraordinary group of public servants doing everything within their power to keep our community healthy and our medical systems functioning. So I'm proud of every single person working on our response to COVID-19 and we're grateful for their work and sacrifice, um, often juggling work, childcare, and all the other demands of life that um, we we're all experienced with. So whatever your role, we thank you and I thank you. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Spitters from the Snohomish Health District. Thank you, Executive Summers. And good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I wanna start this morning with updates on data. Uh, today, we'll be posting our weekly report and snapshot up through Saturday, November 28, as well as some updated maps. You can find those on the data page of the Health District 
later today. A few of the highlights from the data through November 28 uh, show, uh, actually through December 5th, uh, this item, our two week case rate uh, increased again up to 428 cases per 100,000 uh, population. The majority of new cases continue to be in 20 to 49 year olds. Roughly two thirds of the cases are from close contact with a known case or community acquired, meaning they have no other uh, risk factor than, than living in the community. Uh, this means people are getting COVID from folks they know or live with or in community settings like workplaces, church and social settings. This is why we're seeing an increase in the number of outbreak investigations as well. The number of new outbreaks uh, nearly doubled uh, during the uh, week of November 22 through 28, uh, from 19 up to 32 new outbreaks during that, uh, across those two weeks. The continued surge in cases and outbreaks coupled with uh, some uh, technological difficulties with uh, delays in the state uh, forwarding uh, cases to us through the electronic laboratory reporting system has hampered our ability to get in touch quickly with newly confirmed cases. You'll see this in our, in our report showing that our ability to reach cases within the first 24 hours dropped again, another increment from about 30% a week ago down to 21%. Uh, we are reaching about 70% of cases within six days. Uh, that compares uh, relatively favorably with the state, uh, which has reported uh, they're reaching about 30% within six days. As announced Friday, we have 44 long-term care facilities accounting for roughly 500 cases in recent weeks. Clearly, uh, these facilities are uh, a multifocal uh, um, epicenter of, of the outbreak, particularly a source of severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Hospitalization numbers remain high, but relatively stable over the past week or two. Currently this morning, Snohomish County hospitals are holding 87 confirmed and six suspected COVID cases. 14 of these individuals are in respiratory failure and on mechanical ventilation. We're also seeing an, uh, excuse me, another increase is the number of people who have sadly lost their lives due to COVID. We are now seeing the number of deaths each week mirroring what happened back in the spring. COVID death totals for each of the past four weeks from November 1 through November 28th were in order, eight deaths, then six, then 16, and most recently 22 deaths through November 28. Uh, moving over to uh, testing locations and health district operated testing, we're currently operating five drive-through testing locations. The primary core site is at 3900 Broadway in the Everett School District parking lot near Memorial Stadium. It's open seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. At the Everett Community College site at 915 North Broadway, that's also open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. The Linwood Food Bank site at 5320 uh, 176th Street Southwest is open Mondays and Tuesdays from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., as well as Thursdays from 9 a.m. to noon. We have a new site at the Evergreen State Fairgrounds in the front parking lot off of 179th Avenue Southeast in Monroe. That's open Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Last but not least, a Sultan L M Elementary School site at 501 Date Street is open Fridays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The Health District team is working to finalize details for yet another testing site in the north end of the county, so stay tuned for more information on that as it emerges. Last, I'd like to cover uh, a little bit more detail about uh, from the Health District end about what Executive Summers uh, mentioned about personal protective equipment. In the last couple of weeks, we've had several questions about PPE availability, and we wanted to get back to you with a little more specificity. The Snohomish County Department of Emergency Management and the Health District work together on resourcing needs for hospitals, healthcare settings, and long-term care facilities. 
By and large, PPE supplies are steady with a few notes of caution. Gloves continue to be an issue and it doesn't seem that that's going to go away in the near future. They are a high use disposable item with a large global demand for a limited supply. So that's an issue there. N95 masks are currently okay. The, the issue is that they're, they are uh, present in limited selections and uh, healthcare workers that use them are fitted to a specific uh, model, brand and size. Uh, so name brand N95s are becoming harder to get, which again can make it difficult for facilities to ensure the fit testing of employees, because if they switch, switch models, they've got to get re-fit re tested to make sure that that's a good fit. Disposable gowns continue to be okay, but facilities are also encouraged to find alternatives to disposable gowns like reusable cloth gowns and Tyvek suits. Uh, alcohol wipes for surfaces are, have always been difficult to get and they're rarely any to give out in large quantities. We encourage facilities to review the PPE information on our COVID page under healthcare providers buttons. In addition to understanding the appropriate PPE for the task and knowing conservation strategies, facilities also need to plan ahead. We are fortunate to have some local or state businesses that have retooled their operations to fill the PPE supply needs. Businesses and healthcare partners should research what's available and try to maintain at least a two to three week supply on hand. Don't wait until you pull the last glove off the shelf before looking to order. Uh, one more item, preparing for COVID vaccine. Uh, last quick update today is about, about that. We shared, we've all been planning and preparing for vaccine distribution here in Snohomish County for many months since uh, mid to late July. An interim distribution plan has been made available on our website, as have draft plans for phased implementation among prioritized group, especially early in the vaccine effort when supply is limited. That serial prioritization will be harmonized statewide and will follow CDC guidance. Uh, the finalization of that guidance is pending, uh, but we have a general framework that we've we've shared in our, in our plan and, and you can take a look at that. We've been working to get local providers registered to order vaccine through the state and federal channels. And we've been gearing up for the intensive communications, education and outreach efforts that lay ahead. The Snohomish Health District was also selected by the Department of Health and the Centers for Disease Control to be the state's test site for a mock vaccine delivery last week. Our staff received a box that was simulated uh, to be how shipments would arrive, but did not it doesn't contain vaccine. The package took less than 24 hours to arrive once shipped. Inside a dry ice pod was essentially an empty pizza box, but uh, staff followed all instructions provided as if vaccine vials were included. And that box was turned around and sent back yesterday. Participating in this mock delivery helps us locally and the Department of Health better understand the expectations for future deliveries. It also helps us provide more informed guidance for ensuring safe handling and storage procedures to our partners in the community. I know everyone's excited and anxious for more information on what to expect. We too are anxiously awaiting a lot of that. With a number of key meetings happening at, with the FDA and CDC in the next two weeks, we expect to soon have the last few missing pieces of information before shipments to vaccine providers begin, uh, presumably in the latter part of the month. There's a lot of work ahead, but I want to assure you that we're in pretty good shape here in Snohomish County and our partnerships with the county, uh, with the State Department of Health, and with the local health care system uh, make this look like it's going to be a, a strong effort. And uh, we appreciate your patience as we unveil the details as they become available to us. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Executive Summers. Well, thank you, Doctor. Um, the first question is really uh, for both of us. Um, what are your concerns about funding the ongoing health district and county response to COVID-19 with CARES Act funding about to run out? Um, I'll jump in and say, you know, really concerned 
uh, from two perspectives. First, all the work we've talked about, the, the purchase of PPE, the distribution of that, our food programs, purchase of food from farmers and getting that to families, the storage, um, just every effort uh, we've been taking over the last uh, eight months really has been made possible by the CARES Act funding dollars. And to continue those, uh, we're very concerned uh, and we desperately need Congress to um, both provide additional flexibility, but also additional resources uh, to keep this going. It is it's clear we're six to eight months out really before even thinking about any relief from the vaccine. And, and even then, I think next year is going to be very difficult. So having that funding to fund those operations is critical. And the other perspective is just uh, our, our residents, um, those that are out of work or working from home, childcare needs, uh, those that uh, can't pay their rent, um, the food insecurity that we're experiencing is only going to grow uh, as we go through the winter. And you know we're expecting to see a surge from both Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. So we've got some rough times ahead. And those dollars running out uh, at the end of December is very concerning to us. So uh, just keeping these efforts going and the, the increasing need as we go into the winter uh, is very concerning. Doctor. Uh, I agree completely, Executive Summers. We, we obviously can't stop our efforts on January 1. This guy, we've got a long way to go and uh, we need that, that federal assistance to keep continuing all these activities that are focused on the disease control effort here at the health district and all those wraparound uh, mitigating efforts that, that you mentioned. Uh, next question is about the Pfizer vaccine. Um, is it only preventative or has it shown any additional therapeutic benefit? The, the primary endpoint uh, for the phase three studies of the vaccine, of the mRNA vaaccine produced by Pfizer and BioNTech were, uh, are, is prevention of COVID disease. And the, uh, also they monitored for safety. And uh, so what we found is that uh, what they found is about 90% efficacy in preventing COVID. That is people who got the vaccine uh, had only about 10% of the incidence of COVID-19 than the group that got the placebo injection. And then in terms of safety, uh, there certainly are common mild side effects, pain, swelling, redness at the injection site, uh, sometimes tiredness, fever, uh, achiness, uh, especially after the second dose four weeks later, um, but no serious adverse effects. So those are the, that's what the, the trials were uh, measuring and the, the vaccine has not been studied as a therapeutic vaccine to treat COVID disease. It's, it's design intent and the evidence base for it is to prevent COVID disease. Okay, the next question is for Dr. Spitters. Uh, is it a good sign that hospitalizations have stabilized the past two weeks and how does that compare to the doubling of deaths every week you just described? Well, these are uh, related phenomena, uh, but there's some dissociation between them because not everyone that, that dies, dies in a hospital, right? Many of our, uh, our elderly victims to uh, COVID-19 who have been in long-term care facilities who uh, um, don't necessarily get, get transferred to the hospital. So there are some deaths that occur in long-term care. Uh, but you know, both are, are problematic. The, the, the relative flattening of the hospital curve as opposed to the, the death curve, which appears to still be going up, the, you know, there's some faint uh, relief in that, that it's not getting worse. But the problem is, is that still putting the acute care system under stress and uh, uh, limiting the availab availability of other services that hospitals provide and now you've got all those healthcare workers at risk as well, both at work and out in the community. So uh, 90, 90 COVID patients in, um, in area hospitals is, uh, while the, the lack of increase is slim relief, I would say we really need to get that down to get our healthcare system back, back in shape. Uh, I'll leave it at that. 
Okay, there's really two related questions about um, the Thanksgiving in effect. And are we starting to see that um, um, hospitalizations are another factors or is it too soon to tell? And would you anticipate seeing a surge if there is an effect? And there's a related question. Um, is there any indication the current restrictions are actually making a difference? Well, here we are 12 days out from Thanksgiving. The curve through the uh, through December 5th, which would be eight, nine days after Thanksgiving, uh, continues to go up at the same slope it was going up over the past several weeks. So, uh, you know, it was going up before, it's going up after. And uh, I don't know if we blame that on Thanksgiving. It certainly, Thanksgiving certainly appears not to have helped. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit early to see if there's any, you know, big hospital surge or such from that. We would tend to see hospitalizations emerging from now through next week if the, uh, from infections that were acquired at the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, but overall, you know, the continued upward trend at this very high level uh, remains concerning regardless of the precipitating events or how folks handle Thanksgiving, we really need to, to bend this curve. Toward that end, those restrictions have been in place. It's, it's very difficult to say, uh, you know, we haven't seen a dramatic bending of the curve yet from those. They've been in effect, they will have been in effect, I think 12 days roughly through the, uh, or excuse me, 19 days through December 5th. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'd like to see that curve bending. On the other hand, we don't have uh, the counterfactual, meaning what would the curve look like had there been no restrictions imposed? So it's, it's uh, uh, difficult to say. I'm supportive of those because I think we really need to limit indoor public activity in these winter months with such high and escalating rates in the community. And I, I think uh, time will tell uh, whether we're able to use that and uh, our own will in our private settings that are not so regulated uh, to try to turn this around. Uh, question about the vaccines. How will those who are eligible to get the first phase of the vaccine be notified they can get it? Yeah. So uh, the, the, the initial phase of vaccine, uh, the final, final uh, version of the, the serial prioritization of groups over time, uh, is pending, but the, the initial phase is almost, I think, locked in. And that's going to be the highest risk healthcare workers in facilities, inpatient and outpatient, uh, caring for COVID patients or, or suspected COVID patients. And the other group will be long term care facility staff and residents. So those folks are all institution based either employment or by residents in long-term care. So those folks will all learn about and be provided vaccine through those institutions. Uh, were there any problems during the mock delivery exercise and what will the biggest challenge be in vaccine distribution? Uh, there were no problems with the, the shipment. It came in, it had the dry ice, it got here quickly, everything was in order and, and they went through the mock exercise and then boxed it back up and sent it back, which is, that's actually, you know, part of the process. These boxes are, are uh, you know, geared to be held. These are, this is for that super cold vaccine, which if you don't have an ultra cold freezer that goes down to minus 80, you keep the vaccine in this box and then restock the dry ice to, to keep things cold and that lasts for 10 days. But then we wanna turn those boxes over and send them back uh, to the source so that then there will be end up being a circuit of boxes and we don't end up just throwing boxes in the garbage. Um, so, you know, the, I think the main challenge is just all the logistics of, you know, ordering, shipping, procurement, local distribution and making sure things get out. But the planning is, proceeding ahead well. The state is leading that. Uh, shipments will go directly to providers, not through the health district. And uh, we're you know, cautiously confident and optimistic that things will go well. I'm certain that somewhere there will be a glitch or two here or there, and we'll learn from that and try to adjust. 
Um, it's going back to the uh, increasing hospitalizations, uh, cases and deaths, and are the current restrictions making a difference? And how do we know? I think you've spoken to that uh, a bit. Any other thoughts about? I, I, I really, I really don't. No, just. Uh... Uh, let's see. Next, can you please uh, talk more about how the lag in lab information from the state is affecting your ability to break the transmission chain? Mm. Well, there was some. Uh, there, there was the, the the system for electronic laboratory reporting. Is uh, that is the system where laboratories send in the results to the to a basically a, a hub. An information hub, and then that gets basically essentially filtered, and then the those results go out to the respective county health departments where the test specimen originated from, where where the patients uh, reside. It got overwhelmed with negative results coming in. Now that we're doing ten thousand tests a day, and the, the system couldn't handle that capacity, so they had to essentially turn off reporting of negative lab results. I think that led to some um, glitches that I can't specify uh, uh, that also slow down the movement, the flow of positive results, but it's been episodic and short-lived uh, on, a, on a couple of occasions. It's not a major, a major problem. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to roll ahead, just trying to focus on, on uh, getting to people as quickly as we can. I, I, I would emphasize that the sheer number of cases is the bigger challenge and then, rather than the, the flow of information from the state. Um, with 22 deaths in one week, can you speak to the severity of the pandemic right now in Snohomish County? Um, and I, just from my perspective, uh, we were talking before this session this morning about the, having to adjust the charts <coughs> uh, upper limit. If you look at the peak uh, in the climb here this fall and winter, it far exceeds what we saw even in the spring. And so I'm very concerned about uh, just swamping our hospital capacity. It's the numbers that I saw were, were in the 90% above ICU uh, capacity has been filled now. And so there's very little uh, remaining space uh, in the coming weeks with uh, what we expect to see potentially from Thanksgiving and then Christmas and, and New Year's holidays. I'm very concerned that we're just gonna swamp the system and, and really difficult choices are gonna to have to be made in healthcare. So it's, it's severe um, from my perspective, doctor. Agree completely. I think the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, and you have dozens of people dying a week from a, uh, a communicable disease, the transmission of which is, is uh, ongoing and widespread, it's severe. And um, I think the numbers speak for themselves. Question about the Josephine outbreak. Uh, it's been reported that the state sent emergency crews to county long-term care facilities. Uh, any information on that? Well, uh, I know that the, the state hospital infection program uh, has a, a, a um, review process that they do, and they've come to a couple of Snohomish County long-term care facilities. I don't know that it's an emergency crew, I, I, although uh, you may know more than I do about that, but there have been uh, assessments where they go in, look at the facility, uh, have a discussion with the, the management and the clinical staff and, and then verbally and, and in writing communicate guidance to the, the facility to help them control and, and mitigate the outbreak. And that's happened in a couple of places. Frankly, I'm not sure that Josephine was one of those. Uh, we continue to work with Josephine and um, I can, you can see it on the report that's gonna be posted later today, but uh, uh, right now, uh, at that, this would be through the 28th. There were 118 cases uh, uh, at Josephine. I think there's certainly more um, uh, in the subsequent week, but uh, it's the outbreak there's not, not over, uh, but they're working well with our staff and, and doing their best to try to control it. I think we've covered these other things. I'm going to jump down to um, have you been made aware of allegations that a church in Snohomish 
House and Ministry Center is accused of holding big services without masks or social distancing. Uh, are any actions being taken? Uh, yes, we have uh, on multiple occasions uh, reached out to educate the leadership of a uh, of a uh, faith-based organization in Snohomish, and we've also um, uh, reported to the governor's uh, COVID violation website uh, those gatherings. Uh, let's see. Uh, the last question is what are the key changes visitors will notice from the safe start phase one limits on long term care. Well it's it's back to uh, that very, very limited options outdoor visits for those residents who are uh, whose health uh, and, and capacity permits them to engage in an outdoor visit which you know, in these winter months is a tall order for both the visit visitor and the resident. Um, uh, and then otherwise, uh, you know, uh, some places might do these uh, window visits uh, uh, if that's, you know, if the infrastructure permits, but otherwise it's, you know, electronic visits, telephone, uh, tablet, that sort of thing uh, through these type of media that we're using now. And that's uh, a, a, a huge burden on the residents, I think, especially, but also their families. Uh, and um, I regret that we have to, to go there, but I, I just don't see another way to, to mitigate uh, introduction of, of uh, COVID into these facilities. So the earlier question about uh, the state sending staff to long-term care facilities was sending additional staff there from the state and I don't have any information on that. Yeah, yeah I, I, uh, certainly the notion of when a, a, there, is a, there is a mechanism for uh, acute and long-term care facilities if they're having staffing shortages to make requests to the state emergency operations center for, uh, for staffing. And so it may be that uh, with um, either isolation periods on staff members due to also testing positive for COVID or, or quarantines on them that they just couldn't maintain staffing. And, and uh, you know, we'll che I'll check with our long-term care team. And if there's something more meaningful to say than that, we'll get back to you later with something on that. Great, I think that covers it. All right. Thank you, everyone. This is Carrie Bray in the Joint Information Center. We appreciate you joining us this morning. We will go ahead and wrap up now, but please do stay tuned for future media availabilities. Thanks. <laughs>